Of all the holy days on the church calendar, it seems to me that Ash Wednesday requires the least amount of preparation for preaching. I don't have to work and work and work to convince us that we aren't as close to the Lord as we want to be. And I think that all of us would say this evening, and those of you watching at home, I'm not as focused as I should be. I'm not as dedicated as I should be. I'm not as serious about knowing and following God as I should be. Or you may think I'm not as devoted to my faith as I should be, or as I could be, or as I want to be. Truth be told, you know that already. That's why you're here. Just the fact that you showed up tonight gives me all the information, information that I need about you, and it makes me want to be around you. You believe about God, and you're serious about following Jesus. You're serious about Lent. Now, this probably isn't your first Ash Wednesday service, and I'm sure it won't be your last one. Many of you will be here next year and the year after that. So what does that tell us? that we're here every Ash Wednesday. Well, it tells us quite simply that repentance isn't a one and done. Repentance is a lifestyle. Repentance is an ongoing part of our journey. It always has been, always will be. And again, you're here tonight because you affirm that repentance is a necessary part of what it means to be a Christian. It's authentic faith. One cannot legitimately say, I'm a Christian and have no idea what repentance is because the two go hand in hand. And so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us two important things. Number one, life as we know it right now is messed up, isn't it? Life in Phoenix and Glendale and Scottsdale and Mesa and the Ukraine and Russia And the place you're from isn't conducive to living with undivided devotion to Jesus and his kingdom principles. In other words, it's not always easy to have faith and to be hopeful and to be filled with peace and to be a joyous person. Quite a bit of the time, being kind and compassionate and merciful to other people isn't the first thing on our list. Or maybe it is for you. It's not on my first list. First, the first thing on my list. And so life is filled, and I do mean filled, with all kinds of opportunities to choose the wrong thing and to say the wrong thing, to have the wrong emotion, the wrong word, the wrong attitude, the wrong worldview. Life doesn't present us with good and easy things very often. It reminds me of the difference between love and marriage that an old man told me about one time. He said, love is one long, sweet dream. Marriage is the alarm clock. <laughs> so, and I think that's how Christianity is often experienced. The desire is there, the dream is there, but life as a Christian can be a rude awakening because life is messed up, which leads to a second truth. We are messed up. Now, you all look really like decent folk to me, you, and, I, and I think you are for the most part, But our wires of morality and truth and kindness and purity were crossed before we were born. And we can trace that back to Adam. That's why the psalmist said, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in in sin did my mother conceive me. So, instead of loving God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and strength like we were meant to, we're having a good day if we do it 50% of the time, aren't we? The old hymn puts it perfectly that Robert Robinson wrote. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I want you to put on your thinking caps for just a moment. And I want you to imagine that you are God. Okay? Hard to imagine, but I want you to try. What would you do with such a messed up bunch of people? People who were never totally on board. People who year after year after year kept making the same mistakes, doing the wrong thing in the same ways. Well, I'm sure glad that God doesn't do what we would do because we would be in the worst of ways. And so Lent is a time to rethink what we believe about God. You see, I think that our short-circuited minds can never totally grasp the deep, deep 
deep love of God. I know that they can't, I can't, and never completely will. Even in eternity, did you know this? Even in eternity, you will never reach a point where you'll finish the last page and say, now I understand the love of God. It's that deep and that wide and that broad. You know, if, if I have terribly hurt someone or offended them or ignored them or marginalized them or rejected them in public and in private, if I have scorned them and laughed at them and made fun of them and rid, ridiculed them, then I, by nature, am going to do all that I can to avoid those people. I will avoid going to places where I know that they will be because I don't want to see them. I will do my best to never have to see them face to face. And if I have to, I'll try to stay in the background and blend into the crowd. I don't want to have to see people that I've hurt and be reminded of all the dirt that I've done to them. What is behind that avoidance? I think it's several things. It's guilt for sure. There is shame without a doubt. And I think there's some fear there too because I know that someone I have hurt has a right to question me about the things I've done or said. Now, although we won't articulate it this way, I think that we believe some of those very same things about God. There are folks that I've met this past week that believe that God is there to capitalize on our guilt for the sake of guilt. That God is there to cause us great shame for the sole purpose of making us ashamed. People think God wants me to be ashamed. There are people who think that God is there to punish me for all the terrible things I've done for the sake of getting a pound of flesh back from me. And that's where the gospel comes to shake up our belief system. As Elma reminded us from Joel, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, because I'm gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Wow! God isn't exactly like we thought. God is merciful. He's full of mercy and help 24 hours a day. God is slow to get angry, which means exactly that. Did you know that God experiences feelings of compassion toward us and the things that upset us and hurt us and cause us pain? I have no doubt that God tonight is grieving for the people in Ukraine, the families, the children living in fear, the people fleeing the bombing. Unfailing love, you see, means that God will always be there for us, and we run to his arms again and again and again. Everybody listen cl closely. God is completely devoted to you, completely, all the time, even when you're not, God is. And no one could, com could, could care about the direction of your life tonight more than God could. No one could ever care about the direction of each day in your life than God. And that's why God calls out to us in the Bible, turn, 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 turn around. No one cares more about the details of your life than God does. Every appointment, every hour, every experience, every meal you cook, every process, every semester, every assignment, every season, every relationship, every trip, every interaction, every decision, every conversation, every sermon you preach. That's why God is asking, give me your heart because I care about everything. No one cares more about protecting and guiding you and seeing you prosper than God does. And that's why we're called to come home during Lent because God misses us. And so I ask you tonight, during these next 40 days, how will you respond to a God like that? I want to draw closer, to become more aware than ever that God is in Phoenix, that God is in my living room when I go home tonight, that God lives on 32nd and Shea, just like he lives where you live, that God and the God who is there is merciful and slow to anger and compassionate and unfailing love, all the things that I'm not, this mighty, powerful, devoted God is the one who asks, asks a worm like me to draw close to him because he loves me. You know, Lent is more than giving something up. It's adding something you've never known. I have some friends who are going to give up chocolate for Lent. 
Uh, I know a guy who's going to try to quit smoking. I, I, I know some people who are going to quit eating pizza and another person's sugar. And I guess that's okay, but I'm not sure taking a few things away is going to make a big difference. Our diets are completely out of whack, right? If you are what you eat, then I'm easy, fast, and cheap. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, I'm beyond hope. I need lots of help. Here's what I want you to remember for the next 40 days, and it's going to require that you memorize these next six words. Even me, even this, even now. Get those down. Even me, even this, even now. You see, even me tells you that nothing about you is insignificant. There isn't a person in the world that comes close to being who you are. There is only one Pat Best in the whole world. Only one. There's only one Elma in the world. There's only one me. There's only one you. You are one of a kind, and God has a great desire for you to draw close. God has a longing for you to know him in a deeper, more intimate way. Folks, this is your shot. This is your shot in this short little life to know God, even me. And then even this, there isn't anything about you that God doesn't care about. Everything, every thought, every habit, every assignment, every problem, every situation, every predic predicament. And God wants us to know that there is a beautiful plan for the most routine part of your day and for the most messed up part, even this. And then even now, you don't have to wait for Sunday to turn to God. You don't have to wait for a better time. Lent is a training ground for the rest of the year. Now is the time. Now is the time to come just as you are. You know, I remember about a year ago, I, I was just finishing up my duties at the veterans' home, and one of my duties there was I, I would play piano about three times a week for the residents. And, 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 you know, when you do that over and over and over again, there's some days I was just tired and I didn't want to do it, and... And one day, I, I was down in the, in the chapel playing the piano for about, I don't know, 30 residents or so. And I was playing all the old hymns, and, but my heart wasn't in it. It just wasn't. And I don't know if you've ever done something for the Lord, but your heart really wasn't there. And mine wasn't. And I got done, and I was just glad to be done. And, and the RN came in. She said, Tom, Henry across the hall wants to talk to you. And so I went into Henry's room, and I opened the door, and he had heard all this music, and he was, there were tears flowing down his face, and he said, oh, the songs bring back so many memories. And it hit me right then that even me, even that, even then, God was doing something through something that I thought was so insignificant. Don't ever think that, okay? God is at work in your world. Lord, even me, even this, even now, bring those six words home to us over and over in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.